say yes. Wait a minute. Y yes? Got it. Right. All right. All right. That was it. Okay. Good morning, everybody. It's Lisa Salberg. It is November 18th, 2022. You're listening to Tales from the Heart, a podcast from the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association. And today I am joined by Dr. Harry Lever. Harry, good morning. Good morning. Getting ready for Thanksgiving, I hope? Yep. Okay. Um, so today we're going to talk about a couple of things on Tales from the Heart, including um, some updates and some observations from the recent American Heart Association scientific sessions, which were held uh, about a week ago, two weeks ago, actually, in um, Chicago. And I'll go over a little bit of that. We're also going to talk a little bit about, we're not going to talk about weight loss in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We're going to talk about weight management through the holidays. Um, when you live with a, you know, chronic medical condition like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, maintaining balance is really important, um, not only to the HCM community and to others, but when you have the underlying burden of a cardiac disease that doesn't have a cure, you want to make sure that you're managing your life well. And as we go into the holidays, we know people tend to maybe overindulge on salty foods and fatty foods and a little extra alcohol, but that really does weigh heavily on, on the HCM heart. So we're going to have a discussion about that today. And then we're going to talk a little bit about holiday stressors um, and preparing for um, family conversations of things related to, you know, health and heart and genetics. So we'll talk a little bit about that too. We got a lot on the plate here. Um, and at the end of today's um, broadcast, uh, I'm going to tell you where I'm going to be tonight for a book signing. So uh, stay tuned. A friend of mine is uh, in the neighborhood of New Jersey. And if you're at local, um, I'm going to tell you where we'll be at the end of the podcast. So um, if you have questions throughout today's presentation while we're live on Facebook, by all means, put them in the chat and I will be opening that up to uh, monitor for your questions. And without further ado, Dr. Lever, how is it, how should patients and, and families with HCM really prepare for the holiday season? Um, what kind of food should we avoid? What should we lean into? How do we keep the balance? Well, I think it's important that uh, uh, at all times, you want to cut the carbohydrates. That's a big problem. Carbs really raise the, the weight. That's a major problem. And I think uh, increased use of protein and that kind of stuff is important. And um, I, uh, Mediterranean diets are helpful. There's a lot of fish and things like that, which is protein. And um, the other thing is you really don't want to drink alcohol. Alcohol can really gain, you can get, gain weight. It causes significant arrhythmias. So for certain, we want to stay away from alcohol. I, it causes atrial fibrillation. And we want to make sure that, you know, the people celebrating, we don't want to be opening too many bottles. Whiskey, wine, and beer. It's important to... Uh, a, a, a bottle of beer is a shot and a half of whiskey. And that's, that's a lot. And a shot and a half of whiskey is 45 cc. So that, that's, a lot of, that's a lot of alcohol. So you want to make sure you're not doing that. So let's talk about some things that I've kind of incorporated in my life. Well, I'm, I'm the cooker of Thanksgiving dinner for my, my crew. Um, and I have pescatarians in the family. Um, and I have some people with some very specific eating um, criteria, like things that they will and will not eat, um, can and cannot eat, I should say. So like gluten allergies and that type of thing. Right. So we have, um, I come from a family of large holiday meals, never too much butter, never too much salt. Um, so I have altered my recipes in my family. Uh, we've cut out sodium from our stock when we're making stuffing. Okay, 
I know we got to go light on the carbs, but it's Thanksgiving. I'm going for the stuffing. I'm sorry. I know it's not the best food, but a little bit is the way I'm living it. Okay. Um, but you don't want to overdo on the right. carbs. Uh, so have a little bit and have a plan to have a little bit. Don't deprive completely. It's a special occasion. Um, let yourself have a little, um, but don't overdo it. If you want to put more on the plate, go for the vegetables, go for the protein, limit the gravy, limit the sweets at the end of the night. So just take a little bit and have the plan to do that. And don't deny yourself because that just makes you miserable for the holidays. Have a little, but don't, don't fill up the plate. Um, vegetables, roasted vegetables, they're great to throw in the, on the side of the plate. It fills the plate and, and it fills you and it's, it's a good option. Um, and it doesn't, shouldn't have a lot of sodium on it. So Harry, why do people want to worry about overdoing it with salt during the holidays? What can that do to you? Salt can retain fluid. And that's a, that's a problem. And it depends upon the status of your heart. Some people can tolerate sodium. Other ones can't do that. And if there's a tendency to retain fluid, you really got to stay away from the sodium. Uh, and, and uh, you know, there are diets that they, they try to tell you how much sodium. And one of them, if there's a lot of fluid retention, is a two gram sodium diet. That's the amount of sodium. And it's interesting. Uh, um, the, when you buy a package of something that, uh, that you're going to mix in with the food, they tell you how much sodium is in the package. So you can try to figure out how much you're using when you eat and how much you're mixing in with whatever you're eating. So you got you to gotta be careful about that. So let's discuss that for just a moment. And that's labels. You know, right. we in, in the United States, we have um, much to probably not the um, satisfaction of some of the food manufacturers, but we have labeling requirements. So you can see how many calories are in something and you can see how much sodium is in. Right. So when you're going to buy your, your stock or your, you know, your gravy, check the sodium levels on these boxes because there's a lot of sodium hiding in stock and gravies that you buy over the counter. So making your own, does limit what amount of sodium you're getting and let you control it a little bit better. Not yeah. everybody's a, a big cook. So just watch those over the, you know, those pre-prepared um, gravies, sauces, et cetera. Lots of sodium hiding in there. Um, okay. So Harry, we know we've had this conversation many times about alcohol. Some people want a glass of wine with their holiday meal. What should they do to mitigate the alcohol in their system? Should they drink a little extra fluid? What should they do if they really uh, want to have that I, glass of wine? I think, I think that, uh, uh, I, as I remember, a, a, uh, about five ounces of wine is about a shot of whiskey. So you just have to keep that in mind. Uh, you know, if you want a few sips of wine, that's not going to hurt you. But if you're going to sit there and really drink, that's a problem. And, and the problem comes when you, uh, if you load acutely too much, you know, if you just suddenly start getting that bottle of wine and you know, really drinking it, that's a problem. And you, you don't want to do that, particularly if you have a tendency for atrial fibrillation. That, that is a, you know, that is a real problem. And you, you, so just, not to, you just try, you know, again, a little bit is okay, but you don't want to go too much. So let's talk about atrial fibrillation in the holiday season. Um, there is a phenomenon known as holiday heart. Right. You want to talk a little bit about what holiday heart is and how to avoid it? Because it sounds festive, but it's not. No, but holiday heart is what happens when you have the holidays and you drink too much. And you got to remember that uh, 12 ounces of beer, a, a bottle of beer is a shot of whiskey. And the shot of whiskey is about 30 cc's, a little glass of that. So just remember, if you're, if you're drinking uh, a whole bottle of beer, you're, eating, you're drinking a shot of whiskey. And you 
you've got to be careful about that. So you, you, you know, and I think that, you know, it, it, it's, um, you know, you know, you, you don't want to, the other thing we got to talk about is if you're, if you're, if you live somewhere else and you have to go home after the meal is over, you don't want to be driving a car after you've had too much alcohol. Well, okay. I, I completely agree with you there. No, no argument there. Do not drink and drive. Very bad thing to do. Um, right. But let's talk about the, the concept of holiday heart. So that typically you'll find somebody who goes into a little bit of a flutter, a fib, gets a little tachycardic and the heart is taxed. Right. Why does the heart get taxed from alcohol and excess food? What's mechanistically happening there that people well, it, in mind. It, 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 it act, you're drinking the alcohol. You're drinking more than you're used to. And, and so if you are, you know, if you drink too much, that's that's what we call holiday heart syndrome, that you're, you're you know, taking too much alcohol in. And, uh, you know, it, 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 and you got to remember that, that there, the, these equivalencies, you know, and so you may not think you're drinking much when you have a bottle of beer, but one bottle of beer can lead to two bottles of beer, can lead to three bottles of beer. And so you, the mechanism in the heart that happens from alcohol that is not great is it the heart gets a little what dehydrated and that can make it a little more pro rhythmic? Well, no, I think it's just the alcohol itself has a, you know makes the heart you know stimulates the heart, and you you just don't. That's what you know. You just don't want to have too much. You you, you know you you. Uh, that's that's what it's all about. Is drinking too if a little bit's not going to hurt you. One one one. You know you got to remember you don't want to take a, a, a shot of whiskey, a whole glass of wine, and a bottle of beer. That looks like that's about three shots. So it's it, a lot. So go to the water and, and the coffee, or that's right, have right. instead. That's that's you have right. other options. That's right. So right. excess food in in the in the body when you have HCM, specifically with obstructive HCM, we notice that patients report getting very symptomatic after a meal. So if you know you're one of these people who after a large meal you're not feeling so great, please go slow, graze throughout the day. Again, don't deny yourself anything, but you may want to take you know your appetizers or your sides and then come back two hours later for your right. protein and come back later for another side. Eat and, slowly. And maybe what you want to also do is if you have access to an exercise bike before you, you know, before your dinner, a few hours before dinner, get down the bike and exercise a little bit. That'll burn off some calories. And, you know, then you can take a little more in if you burn it off before. So I tell you a little, little family tradition that we have um, when possible. Um, every year we kind of get our, the dinner gets up and running in the stove and when everything's on, it's, you know, it's got to sit there for two hours and cook. Our family takes a hike in the woods together. Um, it's about a mile and a half in um, to actually an old graveyard where our, my great grandparents are buried. So we go up there once a year in the mountains and we hike. So we're burning and, and we're getting ourselves ready for a really big meal. And it's it's not a strenuous walk. So I, and not everybody has a family cemetery in the woods behind their house, but I do. Um, but you can get out and move during the day. Go for a family walk, go visit the neighbors and say, hello, just get get out of the house, move, 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 move. That's right. On the couch That's before right. the meal and after the meal, like, you want to get the, your metabolism up and running. So don't try to run a marathon. It's the holidays, but move, 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 move. Um, and balance the plate and don't overdo it. And so the, the other thing you can do is you, there are these devices that gives you an idea of how much you exercise. A Fitbit, can, 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 you can, uh, it'll tell you the number of steps that you do. The Apple Watch will do the same thing. You can get an idea of how far you're walking, and that's that's very helpful. And um, with the Fitbit, uh, that you, you they're connected usually to a um, iPhone. 
you can calculate the amount of calories that you're eating based on what you tell the device. And then based on that, you can see how, how much you are, how much calories you're taking in. And then based on what, what, how far you walk, you can see how many calories you burn. So it's profit and loss. If you, Absolutely. Take, if you take in, uh, if you take in a little too much food, then you got to burn a little more. And so you just, you just have to be aware of that kind of mathematics. And that kind of help, helps some people to realize what they're doing. Because it's really hard if you don't have some, these new devices can be really helpful. And uh, a lot of people aren't aware of them. And you want to, you just, it calc tells you what you're doing. And that's what you really need to know. I would say that there's another feature on some of the wearable devices today that I have found incredibly helpful and kind of leads into the next part of the conversation today. And that is um, holidays bring a lot of joy. They also bring a lot of family. And for some, that brings stressors. Um, and when you're dealing in a family that has a genetic abnormality in it, um, and when there's multiple branches of the family tree that are going through different medical challenges, whether it be HCM or other things, there's a lot of, there can be tension uh, and there can be um, concern and there can be um, an opportunity to bond and to communicate about what's going on and sharing you know, information that they've learned over the year because maybe they don't get together that often. Um, I just want everybody to be prepared for those emotional moments during the holidays and those stress moments, which includes the empty chair at the table that was taken by somebody who's no longer with you due to complications of HCM or other reasons. So it, there's a lot of stress around the holiday season. And Part of what wearable devices do now, that some of the newer Fitbits, I know the Apple Watch does it, and other wearables, they give you an opportunity to do a little meditation, just take two seconds, two minutes, cover your watch, and just focus on your breathing for a minute. And it helps you balance stress. We know that stress can lead to stress eating around the holidays, and you want to recognize the stressors, and you want to start to confront them. And accept that, okay, this is my stressor. This is really uncomfortable. And give yourself a break and just breathe and take a second for two whole minutes. Two minutes is a long time when you're really just focusing on your breathing. So I would encourage you to start doing it. If you, if you don't have a watch that has this, set a timer for two minutes. Sit in peace with yourself and relax. What do you think, Carrie? Good idea? Yeah, I think that's a good idea. So how else do you think people can stay mentally well during the holiday season as well as physically well during the holiday season? Maybe don't watch the news. <laughs> you know? Yeah, you you're, know, you're right. Maybe just don't watch the news too much. There's just too much out there. And just, you know. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm going to... I'm going to take a slight dive in a small rabbit hole for a moment. I think we all just need a moment. And this is a global all. We just went through a hell of a two years. Like it was crazy. We're coming to the other side. Um, things will take a long time to get back to what we used to think was normal. Um, and in some ways, maybe... Maybe we won't ever get back there and for good reason. Um, maybe there will be some changes in society and how we kind of manage with each other. But we went through a lot. We went through a shift in culture and understanding and technology and, and human contact. And I think everybody needs to relax and enjoy the holidays a little and just, just relax. <laughs> Yeah. Do you see the world that way right now, Harry, or is that just? Oh, I think that's yeah. right. And I think that uh, when you're walking and if you got a cell phone, put some music on it and kind of nice music. Just listen to that and just just 
you know. Change the vibe. Yeah, I think that's important. And I think that, you know, and I think it's, uh, you know, don't, uh, don't listen to the radio when you're walking. <laughs> Just forget about it. Yeah. You know? I mean, that's, that's important. So if anybody has some great tips they want to share about what gets them through the holidays, please put it up in the chat now and we'll read it in just a few moments. Um, I did want to take a minute to go over some things that happened at the American Heart Association Conference. Um, I don't have all the numbers right in front of me, but generally speaking, I think there were 14 sessions. So within a session, there was like five talks. So I think there were about 14 sessions specific to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, and that would mean that it was a subsection. So maybe we're talking about the genetics or maybe we're talking about athletic participation or maybe we're talking about MRI readings or clinical trial results in each one of those sessions. And there were 70 separate posters or abstracts um, related to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, some of them are just meta analysis of how many people have had what procedure and what the outcomes look like, um, things on that nature, all pretty much singing this similar tune that high volume care matters in the quality of outcomes, um, recognizing health disparities in, um, HCM, that it is not widely diagnosed in the black and brown communities and that we need to do more work there, which we're focusing some efforts on ourselves coming up. You'll hear more about it soon. Um, so scientific sessions is kind of a twofold thing. It's number one, here's the latest science. This is what we just found out. This is just getting published. This is what's happened in the past year kind of news. And then there's mild modifications of our knowledge and understanding and maybe you know shining a piece of that story and refining it a little bit better. We aren't ever likely to get perfection in management, but every year we get a little bit better. We evolve a little bit more. We bring more tools, more understanding, more patient voices to the table to draw a clearer picture of what HCM is, what you can do about it, and how we might be able to modify it in the future. This is really what all these programs are all about. And um, Harry, do you remember the days of AHA when the HCM talks were relegated to the last day of the session, the last session of the day, and the furthest room from the most convenient place to be? <laughs> do you remember those days? You were in the room with me. Yeah, yeah. We were, we were pushed to the corners and we, if we got two sessions, we were really excited. Right. We had 13. It's evolving. Understanding is evolving. And I'm not going to fail to recognize the elephant in the room. And that is a new labeled indication drug for the management of HCM. Um, and a lot of enthusiasm around being able to treat something as specifically as we are now potentially able to do. So there's a lot of really optimistic news out there. I met with, uh, I, I can only say a few new companies that are interested in getting into this space, as well as existing companies looking to expand reach to other anatomies within HCM. So not just an obstructive physiology. So it was a really exciting couple of days at AHA. We also had our branded, co-branded materials with AHA front and center in the middle of the AHA heart hub. There we were, um, and I was never so proud <laughs> because the poster that we ended up co-branding with AHA was originally crowdsourced to our Facebook community. And I said, what do you as the patients want to see on educational material? Help me design this. So we would, we would come up with some ideas. We'd throw it up to the community. They'd give feedback and they'd ask for information to be put on the poster. And that then eventually went to AHA for co-branding. It got edited a little bit, but the patient's voice was front and center in that room because of all of you who participate with our community. You know, you are helping teach others. You are helping educate your fellow patients in ways that 
are kind of unbelievable that have come to pass. So thank you all for those who participated uh, in, in the building of those resources. So AHA was promising, exciting. The data coming out on ISN inhibitors is continuing to look promising uh, and positive, uh, not perfect. Not everybody's a responder, but I think we are moving towards a, a better understanding of how to deploy this new tool and developing best practices around that and keeping everybody safe in the process. Um, Harry, you and I talked a little bit about this concept the other day um, about beta blocker therapy for HCM and, and how important it is to our community to get good drugs. And those of you who've listened to uh, Tales from the Heart in the past, you know that Dr. Lever is very passionate about the quality of generic drugs. And the one thing that was clear to me during AHA is there is new, there is cool, there is cutting edge stuff coming, but we're never going to get rid of the base. There's things that we know that work and they work and they improve quality of life and they're inexpensive. But because they're off patent, they're generic, and the quality is highly variable. And this is an area that I think we're, as an advocacy organization, we're going to have to start getting a bit more involved with. And if anybody who's listening is interested in becoming a volunteer on a project related to the quality of generic drugs, please contact us and we will get you on a working group. But Harry, tell us what the problem really is. The problem is, is that... Uh many drugs are being made overseas in India and China, and the quality is just not there. And truth be known, the FDA is not doing as good a job as it should be, and there's not enough testing uh, of these drugs, and we need to know which ones are causing a problem. And uh, um, it, 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 you know, there's, there's more work coming out now. There are more people that are interested in this problem. And there's a website that you can look at now. It's called Americans for Safe Drugs. And it's worth looking at their website and getting an idea of what they're thinking. And they, they you know, they're, 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 they understand that there are these problems and we have to uh, do something about it. And um, um, we can't worry about, you know, one of the, one of the problems is that there are generic drugs that are called authorized generics. That means that they use the original formula from the original drug. Whereas a lot of these generics that are out there, particularly the ones that are coming from India and China, um, they, um, they don't. And, they, 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 and it turns out that there is a problem with the inactive ingredients that are in these drugs. Um, it turns out that the Inactive ingredient is what helps the drug to be dissolved. And if it isn't the right formula, it won't dissolve properly. And that you'd think, well, you know, if we get the active ingredient, it's all right. That's not enough. You need to have that inactive ingredient that helps to make the drug dissolve. And that when you look at when you look at say at metoprolol succinate and you look a list at a list of the drugs and you look at the inactive ingredients, they're not the same one brand to another. So you have to be very careful about that. And, um, you know, there are rumors out there now that the um, CMS, uh, you know, Medicare doesn't wanna pay for the uh, authorized generics. And we, we have to nail that down. That's, that's something that we're starting to look into why this is. And we, I think the government has to be made aware of what, what's going on and where the problems are. Because if we have good drugs for patients, uh, they may not have to go to the hospital as often. They may not have to be readmitted to the hospital. So we need to, we need to know all of that. And that's what we're working on. And, you know, we just have to, you know, there are people, there are more people now that have, have gotten concerned about it. And the pandemic caused a problem also because uh, they, they they cut down on uh, inspections. People were not doing the FDA was not going to these foreign countries to do inspections because of the pandemic, and that's a problem. 
So somehow we've got to figure all of that out and make sure that it's getting done. And so you know, as as you're talking, um, Harry, I just did a little googling over here, and um, looks like four days ago CMS just released its new formulary guideline guidance for 2023. Um, I think the answers lie here. So I'm going to go do a little dig after podcasting today and see if I can find any language that's specific to this issue within the CMS guidance. Um, and if there is something here that is deleterious to the community, we will advise and um, we will speak to our elected officials about this um, if it is really something that is um, adversely affecting us. So I will take the dive in. And we'll see what the new CMS guidance is. And I'm hoping that there isn't a situation in which authorized generics are going to be withheld um, from those seeking that level of purity in their cardiac medications. I will be speaking um, in a couple of weeks to Rosemary Gibson, who is the author of China RX. Um, and we'll be talking a little bit more about this drug quality issue. Uh, maybe we'll bring you on for the end of my interview with her and we can have a little conversation in that podcast. Um, but it's, it's an important area. While we're really excited to add new uh, innovation to our medical therapy for HCM, the base therapies still are incredibly helpful to thousands upon thousands of patients. Tens of thousands, let hundreds me, of thousands. Let me just give another warning. You've got to be careful that if you seem to be stable on one of the brands, and then all of a sudden something seems to happen where you're retaining fluid or you're getting chest pain or shortness of breath, you got to look at the bottle that you got from the pharmacy the last time. Because it turns out, and most people are not aware of this, that the pharmacy can change the manufacturer and doesn't notify the physician of that. And the patients have to be made aware that you don't leave the pharmacy till you look at the bottle of what, and look at the tablets of what you're getting now and make sure they look the same as the last stuff that you got because they that everything is the same, but it's not. So you've got to look at that, at the bottle and make sure what they look like. And if they're not the same, don't let the pharmacist give it to you because it comes down to how much does it cost? That's what they go by. And so there was a problem that happened about eight, maybe a year ago now, where you had somebody who had a crumbly form formation right. of their drug. So right. can you talk about texture of the pill as well? Well, it turns out that it's what they look like and what they, you know, when you look at the bottle, is there dust in it? Are the pieces are the pieces falling apart? You got to look at all that, and uh, if unfortunately that's not been um, you know high on the on the uh, the list of what uh, patients are told and what the FDA is doing. So you've got we've got to be careful about this. Okay, well, I just opened up a couple of documents. It's probably going to take me a good hour and a half to get through some of this. Um, and peel back the layers of the onion to figure out what's really at the core here. So we'll, we'll take a look at that and report back with any findings um, or actionable items on uh, the current situation. But I think it's really important to make sure patients understand that while we're moving forward and understanding, and there's many more options available, and we can do so much to improve quality of life for those with HCM, um, we don't abandon things that we know that work um, and immediately, you know, go to the most aggressive thing possible. For most patients, you will have periods of time that can be years, decades, where HCM mildly impacts your life and you're well managed on a, on a, on a simple medication or some of you not man you know, don't need medication yet. But when you do, you want to know that what you're getting is, is good quality um, and that you go slow and make decisions wisely. You have one heart. And to quote my favorite line from my favorite poem, you have one wild and precious life. 
And you want to make really good decisions about how you're going to manage, manage that heart that's going to get you through everything. Um, so go slow in your learning process. Make sure you're getting input from trusted professionals who have processes and programs in place that help manage HCM at the highest quality possible. Um, we continue to work on adding resources to supplement um, that work, uh, your emotional well-being, uh, your feeling of a community. All of these things are really important as well. And we're all here in this crazy journey together. So um, I'm doing a lot of year-end wrap-up stuff now, Harry. Can you tell I'm getting a little philosophical? Uh, well, the other, the other thing that you've got to be careful about, if, uh, let's talk about people that may have a problem and they're depressed. The yes. same thing go, goes there. If, if they suddenly change the manufacturer of what you're taking, it may not be working. This is, uh, and you got to be aware of that. You can't just assume that everything is okay with what you're, te- what you're swallowing. And uh, that, that's a major problem. There are papers coming out now about that, that have been, you know, there, some people are just not feeling as well as they did because that class of drugs was changed on them too. So you've got to be, you know, if, if you're suddenly feeling down in the dumps and you've been taking something to feel a little bit better and all of a sudden it's not, you, you're not feeling right, you got to look into that. Check your manufacturer. That's right. Be consistent. That's right. Consistent with your manufacturer. If you keep bunching around, bunching around from one to another, right. it, it's, it's not good. I, we talked about it before. I had a problem with my tacrolimus, which is my anti-rejection medication. I, because I'm acutely aware, because Harry and I have been talking about this stuff for over a decade now, um, I went and had a blood test. And when I had my blood test, I found out that I was below therapeutic because they had changed my manufacturer due to a shortage from my original manufacturer. It was generic to generic. It was just different generics, but generics can be between 80 and 125% of the, the original formulary. And if the dilution is off and you're dropping that drug into your system too fast, then you go periods of time without it. And these are really important things to somebody who is trying to not reject an organ um, to keep that balanced. Uh, So you've got to know what you're taking. It's really important and make sure that your manufacturer is consistent. If it's changed, don't assume doom and gloom. It might be okay. Take the drug for a week. If you don't notice any change in how you're feeling, then you're probably okay. If you notice that you feel differently, then go back and request the same manufacturer. Um, I've done it. It's just a conversation with the pharmacist. Not a big deal typically, and they will be accommodating. So um, any other thoughts about the holiday season, weight management, stress management, Harry? No, I think we've kind of covered them pretty much. But we're, and What's your favorite part of Thanksgiving? What do you mean by that? I'm not sure what you mean by that. Is it the food? Is it the turkey? Is it the dessert? Is it the family? What is I mean, it? I think it's uh, getting the family together and we're, we're, uh, you know, we're in some of our, our we're going to have some people over to our house for dinner and my wife's working on it. And, and, What's your role? What are you doing to help? Staying out of the way? Yeah, usually, I guess. <laughs> uh, sometimes we prefer that from the, from our husbands. Um, my husband will be smoking our turkey for the second year. Oh. So I will report back to tell you how that worked out. It came out good last year. So I have high expectations for this year. And then I do all the sides and everybody comes on over. So it's really fun to have the, the whole family together. The right. goes so fast. And just nice to stop for a day and just, oh no, there's little white things falling outside, Harry. Uh, well, you're here too. Oh no. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's not too bad here yet, but it was, I don't know what it's going to do, but it's, it was starting to snow a little bit. I don't necessarily know that I would call this snowing or spitting, but there's white things falling from the sky right now. I'm not happy. Right. Right. Today's one day closer to spring, although we have to get all the way through winter first. That's for sure. But we'll get there. We'll get there. Okay. So I did say I had an announcement to, at the end of the day here. Um, I will be at Barnes & Noble in Paramus tonight with David Moscow 
who will be doing a book signing. David Moscow is a friend of mine for many, many years. Um, you may not know him by name, but if you've ever seen the movie Big with Tom Hanks, he played young Josh Baskin. <laughs> Uh, he was a child actor. He was also in Newsies and a whole bunch of other stuff. You can IMDB him. Um, so he's just written a book. Oh, I don't have it with me or I would show you. It's in the car. Um, and it's about sustainable living. It's called From Scratch. And he has been traveling around the world and documenting how different cultures harvest their food and where it comes from. And He's um, made some films on this. He does uh, filmmaking now and and writing. And he's going to be here in New Jersey. He is traveling around the country on a book signing. He donated 500 books to the HCMA. Some of you got them in the mail. We kind of went through the, the mailing lists. And, and if you'd volunteered recently or you were a new member, et cetera, or lifetime member, uh, we went with the first 500. If we get more, we'll send more. Um, it was through a project called Worthy Books, um, where they were donated. So it was a no cost event to the HCMA, just a gift from my friend, David Moscow. So if you're in Jersey, I'll be up there at Paramus Park Mall tonight, or, or it's not Paramus Mall, it's the Barnes and Noble is in Paramus, which I think is in the Garden State Mall. Sorry, I said that wrong. Um, <clears throat> so I'll be up there tonight with some friends and some books and I'll introduce you. So if you're around, Find us at 6 30, 7 o'clock. We'll be there. Um, there you go, Harry. That's that concludes this episode of Tales from the Heart. Uh, I appreciate your input on how to manage your weight and stress during the holiday seasons. And as always, keep up the good work on the generic drug quality fight. And hopefully we'll get some people to take a listen to us soon and take some really um, yep. specific action. Yep. Great. All right, Facebook folks, thanks for watching. Good to see you all. Karen, Lori, Lisa, Debbie, Gail, have a great day. Please.